Something I've noticed in the last several years being a part of the gaming community, whatever that means, is that the term masterpiece has been vastly overused in recent years, pretty much used to describe any game that is incredibly overhyped and chilled. How many Sony exclusives have been described as a masterpiece? Now, how many of you have been disappointed when you actually played the game? Now, of course, if you're a casual or a fanboy, I'm sure you enjoy watching hours of cutscenes instead of actually playing the game and absolutely adore such deep themes as revenge is bad and be better, which is simultaneously the most condescending and hypocritical theme I've ever heard given the type of people who make these games. And look at this creature. Thank you, everyone. That's a creature. Absolutely... Even when Masterpiece is used to describe a truly great game like Elden Ring, I still have to dispute the use of the term because Elden Ring, while very fun, is also a greatly flawed game. And if you've been playing the Souls series since at least Dark Souls 1, then you've really already experienced almost everything it has to offer already, unless you wanted another giant empty open world with copy-paste dungeons and fighting the same bosses over and over again. So of course we get to the subject of this video, which is, well, what do I consider a masterpiece then, since apparently I hate every game. And seeing as the Resident Evil 4 remake is about to release, I thought what better time to re-review one of my favorite games of all time, and that original video is completely unwatchable for multiple reasons, whether it's the audio quality, or my terrible script, or my monotone voice, or any number of reasons really. So I'll attempt to explain once again why I love Resident Evil 4 and why I think it really is a true masterpiece in one of the greatest games ever made. Now as I've said many times by now, the gameplay is the most important part of any game and naturally Resident Evil 4 absolutely nails this. Now that being said, this game will likely put off a lot of people for various personal preference reasons, namely the fact that it's a game with tank controls and you have to stand still to aim and shoot things. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that will never give this game a proper try just because of that little deliberate control decision. I don't have a single problem with not being able to move and shoot. And obviously, I don't have a problem with tank controls either, seeing as every other game in the series prior had them. So it was never really an issue for me, but I can see why it would bother people used to more conventional controls for third-person shooters. Once you get past that, pretty much everything else about this game is fucking perfect when it comes to the core gameplay. Every weapon in the game feels useful and fills a specific role in combat. Even the weakest handgun in the game can stun lock basic enemy types. And I know this is no longer a unique mechanic these days, but there's something intensely satisfying about enemies flinching based on where you shoot them, and this actually has utility in game. If you shoot a running enemy in the leg, they'll fall down. If you shoot them in the hand, they'll drop their weapon. If you shoot them in the head, you can do a follow-up melee strike that has invincibility frames. And of course, eventually when you start to get overrun, you can quickly swap to the shotgun and just knock everyone on their ass. The rifles can blow someone's head off at infinite range. And the magnums, well, are magnums. They can easily kill any normal enemy in one shot and absolutely demolish bosses once upgraded. Is it a little cartoonish and over the top and not at all realistic? Yeah, but it feels awesome. The only standout guns in the base roster that don't really fit in any particular role are the TMP, which is the only automatic weapon before you beat the game. Some people love it, some people hate it. Personally, I love it, at least before you get the Magnum, after which it becomes completely pointless, but before that, it's a pretty decent boss-killing weapon and can stun lock groups of enemies. Not quite as well as the shotgun, but still pretty useful in certain circumstances. And the other weapon is the Mind Thrower, which honestly, I forgot even existed once again, just like my original review of this game, because I never used the thing. That being said, it is weirdly good once upgraded. It basically shoots homing sticky bombs on enemies. Resident Evil 4 is one of those games that as you get better at it, you begin to feel like a god of war. You're absolutely unstoppable. 
for whatever reason, none of the normal Ganados use guns, but they drop ammo. So the only way that they stand a chance against your vastly superior firepower is to fight you in numbers. And so dominating these crowds of enemies by abusing invincibility frames or blasting them all on their ass with a shotgun or vaporizing them with a well-placed grenade, that's another great element of this game as well, is the gore. It might be a little simplistic, you can only explode heads or, like I said, vaporize them on the spot with grenades or their own dynamite that you explode out of their hand. Boom! It's just so satisfying to shoot things. I can't say that enough. To the point where most of the quote-unquote puzzles of this game are just shooting something in the environment with a satisfying sound effect. And something else that I have to give this game a lot of credit for, that for some reason modern third-person shooters don't rip off this, is that instead of having a reticle, you have a laser sight, and your bullet always lands on the target. There's no weapon spread outside of the buckshot for the shotgun, so if you fuck something up, it always feels like it's your fault, and when you do something really cool, it feels great. So honestly, at the end of the day, I don't think this game really needs movement mechanics of any kind, because pretty much all of the skill just boils down to aiming and shooting. That might not be enough for some people, and this game is, especially on the easy side for PC, even on professional difficulty, it's not that bad with a mouse and keyboard. But that doesn't mean it's not fun. It is fun as hell. Now, of course, gameplay mechanics are only half of the gameplay experience. The other half is level design. And Resident Evil 4 has some of the greatest variety in its level design and encounters that I've ever seen. It is honestly impressive how many ideas that Capcom managed to fit into this game, and it is something that I've seen as somewhat of a minor criticism, that it's all over the place, it's cartoonish, there's really no horror aspect to this outside of some of the early village segments and of course the regenerators near the end, and I absolutely agree that it's not a scary game, but it really doesn't fucking matter just because of how fun it is. It's crazy to me just how many good ideas Capcom had. You could make an entire video just examining the level design of this game. But for those of you who haven't played the game, just try and picture this, right? You're a few hours into the game and you make your way inside of some huge medieval castle. And early on you have to dodge giant flaming cannonballs being thrown at you. Then you fight a blind dude with giant claws in some kind of prison. Then you have to kill these invisible bugs in the sewer. Then there's like a 20 minute segment where you play as Ashley, and this is the only time you play as her. And in the original Japanese version, this segment actually had fixed cameras, like the original Resident Evil games. And with the RE4 Tweaks mod, you can actually bring this back to the PC version. Then there's a room with like molten iron or bronze or some shit, it looks like lava, and you have to shoot down these giant dragon statues that breathe fire, and that's not even the craziest stuff that happens in the castle. There's a fucking minecart ride, there's a giant statue that tries to squish you, and all the while this tiny evil Napoleon man is taunting you, and Leon's talking shit the whole time, and Leon's character is just another awesome part of this game that of course is not in any other Resident Evil game. I've been expecting you, my brethren. No thanks, bro. Why don't you do us all a favor and leave before the audience gets pissed off? <laughs> You're nothing but an extra in my script, so don't get too carried away. Your biggest scene is over. I don't ever remember being a part of your crappy script. So maybe you have nine lives, but it doesn't matter now, Mr. Kennedy. I've sent my right hand to dispose of you. Your right hand comes off? <laughs> it's too good. It's too good for this world, dialogue like that. It's... You're never, ever gonna see that shit again from any high-budget production. Now, is every part of this game great? I would almost say yes, but then I remember that Ashley exists. About a quarter into the game, you rescue the president's daughter, Ashley Graham, and the game turns into a glorified escort mission for roughly two to three hours of its length. Now the good news is, for about half of that length, you can just shove Ashley into a dumpster where she belongs, 
or there's usually some out of the box way to keep her outside of harm's way. But for the other half of the time, you have a character that can die in one to two hits, including your own friendly fire. And on top of that, you can also get a non-standard game over if one of the Ganados picks her up and walks through a door. This can definitely create a lot of frustration if you don't know what you're doing. Normally, she will duck out of the way if she's in front of you, or she'll run behind you if you pull out your knife. So Capcom tried their best to make her not annoying, but at the end of the day, escort missions suck. There's a reason why years later, they just make companion characters completely invincible, because it's much easier that way, and people usually don't even notice. But disregarding the few Ashley encounters that suck ass, I'd say the rest of the game is pretty consistently great. Even the island section, which a lot of people don't like for some reason, which really goes over the top. If you thought there was any small amount of realism or horror left, outside of the handful of Regenerador appearances, the island is peak camp. There's a part where you ride in the back of a giant bulldozer, and you're just shooting dudes who sprint up to the back of the thing and jump on. It is so stupid, but I love it. And honestly, that's this game's tone in a nutshell. It is a dumb game, and I love it for that. It doesn't take anything seriously. That being said, if you're a longtime fan of the series, you know Resident Evil is no stranger to goofiness. I don't even need to play you any clips that you've seen a thousand times of the shitty voice acting from the original games. But even before Resident Evil 4, Code Veronica has some of the stupidest shit in it. I swear classic fans ignore that that game exists. And it's a pretty good game. I will not allow you fools to escape. This is what you get for trying to oppose me. Now feel my revenge. <laughs> But it's also where all this B-movie schlock started. Not RE4, dude. Alfred, you cross-dressing freak! And since I've basically already gone on to a tangent about it, we could briefly talk about the story and the characters. Greatly fitting to the rest of the game, it's basically just a B-action movie plot. The president's daughter gets kidnapped by a mysterious cult in not Spain. And so Leon is sent by himself to go rescue her. Now, in between games, the Umbrella Corporation was taken down from the events of RE2 and 3, and Leon became a Secret Service agent, which is pretty cool. And the cult Los Illuminados is infected by a mysterious parasite called Las Plagas, which turns them into smart zombies, which are controlled by a hive mind. And as you might expect, Sadler, the leader of the cult, has one of the Master Plagas inside him, and he plans to infect the President's daughter with the parasite to control the United States and, by extension, the world. And I'll be honest, the rest of the plot doesn't even really matter. This is more just about specific scenes and dialogue writing and, once again, campiness. That's what sells this game. Leon's one-liners, Luis being a suave rogue, Ashley being completely useless, Ada being mysterious, Salazar acting like a petulant child, and Sadler being the egomaniacal villain who never loses his cool until the end. Just kind of generic shit like that, but it works so well. Perhaps you are disillusioned with overconfidence just because you killed my small-time subordinate. Sadler, you're small-time. Now, unfortunately, I already know what you're thinking, especially given this video will release very close to when the remake comes out. But yes, I am aware they cut out several of these lines from the remake, which is depressing. As not only are they trying to go for a more serious tone, but some of these scenes might be construed as misogynistic. Oh my god. I see that the president's equipped his daughter with ballistics, too. How rude. <sighs> Women. Well, if it isn't the bitch in the red dress. And look, I'm not going to start Doom posting about the remake. I'm not even going to talk about the demo. I did play it, and I did enjoy it, but I'm biting my tongue because honestly, this video will be even more dated if I talk about that. I'll just hold my thoughts for the remake release. But to circle back once again to the level design, another great element of this game is the boss fights. There's a lot of them. And as you might expect, they each have their own unique gimmicks, but with the exception of the Del Lago fight, they're still defeated the same way you would defeat any other enemy. You shoot them until they die. 
And I think there's a certain beauty in that kind of simplistic boss design. Yes, worst case scenario, maybe they could feel like a bullet sponge. But honestly, I would still take this method any day over the old style of Zelda boss fight where you hit the weak spot three times or do whatever gimmick bullshit. It's just not engaging. Now, much like other Resident Evil games, or to compare to something everybody's played at this point, one of the Souls series, it's more like knowing the boss's patterns and their openings to know when to shoot them. Some of the bosses have unique weaknesses, like Mendez is weak to fire, Krauser is severely weak to the knife, which gives that fight a really interesting playstyle, especially when you fuck it up several times in a row like I did. And yeah, I think you get the idea. I don't need to list a bunch of things again. If I had to name one minor issue I had with these boss fights is similar to Kingdom Hearts 2, quick time events are incorporated into the fight itself. Now, unlike Kingdom Hearts 2, which actually implemented them very well, I think Resident Evil 4, much like the cutscene quick time events, is just too annoying. Especially when you have to hit two buttons at the same time with an incredibly small window where you can actually hit the buttons to dodge. It's going to cause a lot of frustration. Getting hit does not feel good. It should always feel like you fucked up in some way. But when it's a quick time event, then it's just a test of reflexes, not really skill. And when you see it coming, you can just spam the quick time event buttons before the animation even happens, and then there's no skill at all involved. So that's one minor issue I could definitely see the remake fixing. And as you can probably imagine, on top of having a large variety of boss fights, there's also a surprisingly big enemy roster to fight as well. Now for most of the game you are going to be fighting three variations of the same handful of Ganado villager types just with a different skin and amount of health and slightly different attack patterns depending on which of the three sections of the game that you're in. But honestly I don't have a problem with the reskins because they're just different enough in their attack patterns and how you can interact with them that it doesn't feel lazy, and specifically the cultists, you can shoot them in the knee and then suplex them to explode their head, which never gets old. Double suplex. Triple suplex. Can I get, can I ask for a fourth suplex? And after the Del Lago fight, there's a chance that every villager in the game, upon death, will have their head explode and then split into a type of Plagueis tentacle, depending on which type of villager it is. And these make the enemies much more dangerous, as they do significantly more damage, or in the case of one of the types, can just kill you in one hit by chomping your head off. Now, if you've played the game, you already know there's a very easy way to deal with these guys. Just throw a flash grenade and it instantly kills them. So like I said, every weapon in the game has a use. But outside of these basic villager types, there's also a bunch of different mini-bosses, no doubt, which I've already shown a bunch of footage of each. I won't say the enemy variety comes anywhere close to the amount seen in the Soulsborne series, which is the highest I've probably ever seen in any single-player game. And I feel like I've praised that aspect of those games probably five times over the course of this YouTube channel. It really can't be stated enough how important enemy variety is and how well the Souls games pull that off. But I would also say that you can get away with having low enemy variety if the level design and the pacing are sufficiently good. And the perfect example of that is Half-Life 2. Over half that game is spent shooting the same Combine Soldiers and Headcrab Zombies, and yet it's rarely boring because of Valve's top tier level design that constantly keeps you guessing, and Resident Evil 4 is much the same way. Now we get to some of the more minor details I love about this game. A lot of people will probably think I'm overselling certain elements. But if there's anything I've learned from playing hundreds of video games, it's that the devil is in the details. Screwing up very minor basic elements probably don't matter to most casual gamers, but sometimes they really add up. And Resident Evil 4 is more like the opposite, where they've nailed things that people probably won't even notice, like the inventory system, which is by far my favorite inventory system ever in any video game. And it's simple, it's just an attache case, and you arrange your weapons and ammo and healing inside the case. And the reason why it's so satisfying is because they're the actual in-game models that you're moving around in the case. It's not some, like, stylized minimalistic imagery. There's no shitty black outline around it. Yeah, don't think I didn't notice the remake already fucked this up. But again, I realize 95% of players don't care. 
Another element that I think was handled really well by Resident Evil 4 is the progression system. It's pretty simple. Enemies drop ammo, and sometimes they drop money. If you have a lot of ammo, they have a higher chance of dropping money, and you can use this money to buy new guns, expand the inventory case, upgrade your existing guns, and even just the upgrading is very satisfying. I know some people don't really care seeing numbers go up, but I feel like these numbers go up enough to matter. Especially since once you buy all of the upgrades for a gun, you unlock an exclusive upgrade that considerably increases one of its stats. And this is the main difference between the various different guns in each category, right? There's four handguns. I prefer the Red 9, not just because Mousers are cool, but also because it does the most damage by far. With the exclusive upgrade making it do 6.5 damage, which is 6.5 times the damage of the starting handgun at the beginning of the game. That's a massive damage increase, obviously. Probably the most ridiculous one is the Striker Shotgun, which has a 100 round capacity <laughs> exclusive upgrade, which by the time you can afford it, you'll never have to reload again. That's awesome. Doesn't make any sense, but it feels great. And that's this game in a nutshell. Now, unlike most modern games, once you've rescued Ashley and defeated Sadler and saved the world once again, there's actually plenty of bonus content. New Game Plus is the most basic of these and something you'll even see in some modern games, surprisingly enough. But the difference is in Resident Evil 4, there's actually a reason to play this New Game Plus, that being bonus weapons and extra costumes. Some of the bonus weapons are earned for free from the other game modes or beating the game in professional difficulty, and a couple of them are absurdly expensive and also appropriately overpowered. It's safe to say all of these just kind of break the game, so it really just comes down to personal preference which one of these you'd prefer using. Though I gotta say, the ultraviolet laser cannon is a little too broken to actually be interesting to use. And as for the extra costumes, one of Ashley's actually makes her completely invincible and enemies can't pick her up anymore since she's wearing a suit of armor. So that's pretty funny. So for some of you, it's probably not worth another playthrough for this stuff on its own, but it can be fun to basically go god mode on the early game. As for the other modes, we have Separate Ways, which is a separate campaign where you play as Ada Wong and it shows her side of the story and reveals some extra story details. Basically, she was working for Wesker the whole time to try and get one of the Master Plagueis samples. And she was the one who hired Luis Serra to infiltrate Los Illuminados. As for the levels themselves, three out of five of them are just rehashes of areas from the main campaign, so that's not too interesting. One of them is a completely original level where you take out a battleship, which sounds cool, but it's probably the least well-designed level in the game. It's actually kind of annoying. And then the final level is half original stuff, half old stuff. You fight Krauser again, and he's way easier this time. It's almost impossible to lose if you're knifing him. That's a large thing you have there. but I don't like it when men play rough. And then for those of you who are disappointed with the final boss with Sadler in the main game being too easy, well, I have good and bad news for you. The Sadler fight at the end of Ada's campaign is complete fucking bullshit. She is not prepared to fight that man. It is quick time event central, and if you even fuck one of them up on professional, he takes out pretty much all of your health. And no joke, this guy can take like 20 explosive bowgun bolts to the face. It takes so long to kill him, it's ridiculous. But I gotta say, despite the rehashed content and a shitty final boss, I think Separate Ways is still worth playing for the extra story details, and Ada has a couple exclusive guns that are fun to play around with, so I'd recommend giving it a shot after beating the main campaign. Then we have Assignment Ada, which is probably the most pointless of these. It's basically a mini-game where you have to find five Plaga samples across the first half of the island, and you just kind of shoot guys. And it seems like the only purpose of this is for a leaderboard high score, which I don't think anyone really cares about anymore. I guess if you just want more Resident Evil 4, it's something to do. But if you just want to shoot guys, you're much better off just playing The Mercenaries, the final mode. Since Mercenaries has been in several entries of the series by now, you probably already know how this works. You kill a bunch of guys in a time limit and you're given a score. 
you get to select between several different characters who already have a preset loadout. And there's also several different stages which have their own quirks. And this is the only way you're going to get to play as Hunk and Wesker. So I'd say this mode is worth checking out just to unlock them and try them out. So all in all, I'd say none of these modes are really necessary for you to play. They're really just there if you want more Resident Evil 4, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And unlike modern games, you didn't have to buy these separately. They just came as a part of the main package. And yes, I'm aware that not all of these modes were a part of the original GameCube release, but they've been a part of every other release, so it doesn't really matter. Most of you are not going to be playing this on GameCube. So in conclusion, Resident Evil 4 is absolutely a masterpiece. It's one of the greatest games I've ever played. It's one of my favorite games of all time. I've played it probably seven or eight times at this point. And yeah, I'm not going to pretend it's a perfect game. I acknowledge some of its minor flaws in the review, whether it's the somewhat antiquated controls or the Ashley Graham segments. And honestly, just the fact that you have to pause to switch weapons gets annoying eventually. And I'm sure you could name a bunch of other little minor issues that you had with it personally, but almost none of those things actually affect my enjoyment of the game, and that was the point of my personal definition of Masterpiece, which I'm not going to bother giving out here because it doesn't really matter. What does matter is that Masterpiece has become a fucking buzzword, a marketing term, that shills use to pretend their favorite game on their shitty console should be respected by other people because it's super mature and cinematic and all that shit. You know what I'm talking about. Do I even have to say it again that God of War Ragnarok is not a Masterpiece? Because it's not fun. Your game has to at least be fun to be a Masterpiece. It can't be boring. If your game is boring at any point, it has failed as a video game. Because a video game is an entertainment product. Yes, it is also art, but I also don't have some kind of pretentious definition of art. I would argue Resident Evil 4 is just as much art as any of your pretentious garbage. Whether it's the art house indie games or the stupid cinematic normie shit. Resident Evil 4 is one of the funnest games ever made. It has so much love put into the level design, the sheer variety of ideas here. You're gonna see something new every 15 minutes. That's more than I can say for almost any game made in the past 10 years. You're never gonna see that kind of effort in a game again. Yeah, you might see it in the visuals. Of course, that is probably the most dated aspect of this game, and if you haven't noticed, I am playing this with the RE4 HD Project mod, so it does look a bit better than the original release, that's for sure. Those guys did a great job at actually properly remastering the game while remaining faithful to the original visuals. But as I've said many times in the past before, I don't really care about graphical fidelity that much. I can play PS1 games I'd never played before growing up and still have a great time. So personally, I never believed Resident Evil 4 needed a remake. Will I play the new one and review it? Of course. But I have absolutely no expectations that the game will be as good as this game. It's a modern game. The chances of that being the case are astronomically low. But that doesn't mean that the remake can't stand on its own in some ways. So we'll just have to wait and see. And yes, I've seen all the glowing reviews for the remake. I don't care. I don't trust anybody at this point. But like I've said in the past, I enjoyed the Resident Evil 2 remake for what it was, and I still enjoyed the original Resident Evil 2, so hopefully the Resident Evil 4 remake changes enough to stand on its own two feet and I can enjoy it separately from the original, I guess. That's really the best case scenario. That said, the original Resident Evil 4 is absolutely worth your time if you've never played it. It is one of the greatest games ever made, so be sure to check it out at some point, I guess. I'll see you next time, guys. So, uh, after you take me back to my place, how about we do some, um, overtime? No way, fam.